21st, 2021 meeting to order. The first order of business is to record the attendance. I will call your name <coughs> and respond. First one is Cleo Duckworth. I'm here. Susan Matson. Lorinda Hale. William Johnson. Here. Ruby Baker. Here. Ruby. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Oh, David sorry. Gleason. Okay. David Gleason. Here. Rick Cowan. Uh, Charlene Oliver. Uh, Elliot Trevino. Here. That's everybody except Charlene is present and accounted for. Uh, next on the agenda is I'm going to read. Read the um, virtual meeting um, statement. The Emergency Communication District of Nashville and Davidson County has determined that meeting electronically is necessary to protect the public health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans and the citizens of Nashville and Davidson County in light of the coronavirus and that pursuant to Executive Order Number 163451. 60, 65, and 71 issued by Governor Lee for the state of Tennessee, the Board of Directors of the Emergency Communication District of Nashville and Davidson County is conducting its meeting electronically, having gear, given clear notice of the meeting agenda and how the public can access the meeting electronically at a time and location reasonably accessible to all members of the public. And next thing is, everybody should have gotten a copy of the minutes from both the October 15th and the October 21st meeting, unless there's some additions, corrections, a motion to approve would be in order. So the October... Brenda has a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. David, do we have any other discussion? All in favor? Okay. Aye. 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 But the minutes reflect everybody that's present voted yes on that. Uh, next up is we're going to review the December 2020 financial statement, Mark. Okay. I'm going to try to bring it up here so we can. Ms. Duckworth and Mark, yes. uh, just as a matter of uh, course, I know that. These governmental entities such as municipalities, the Board of Aldermen, any council, things of that nature, are having roll call votes. So oh, okay. we being being a governmental entity, we probably ought to have a roll call vote on on okay. the rest of the matters. I think obviously approval of minutes, we don't have to go back and roll call that since all members present uh, said aye, but if um if we could do quick roll calls on the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll do that. All right, I'm going to bring up a copy of the financial statement here for us to, to look through. Everybody should have gotten a copy of this uh, December financial statement uh, about a week or so ago. As you can see here on our balance sheet, uh, right now we have about uh, almost $16.4 million dollars uh, What's that? We don't see it. You don't You're see sharing. it? Ah, I, I can see it. But okay, how do I share it here? Let's see. Here, here, here. Do we not also need to approve the November financials since we didn't meet in December? Well, we didn't. We didn't. Yeah, we didn't meet. Um, yeah, you guys got a copy of that too last month. Yeah. So let's see here if I can figure out how to. Well, it's not allowing me to share. Your screen. I have, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> to give you the ability to share. Hey, hey Brandon, can you hear me? Can you give Mark presenter ability so that he can uh, share the financials? Well, 
Oh, let's just. Are you there, Brandon? Go ahead. Yeah, can you give a can you give Mark Lynham presenter ability so that he can share the financials? We're good now. Try it now, Mark. Okay. Can you see it now? No. Nope. Right at the bottom. Yeah, here we go. There we go. I see it. All right. Um, okay. Let us know we got the um, amended charter. Uh, so we got two people to file for unemployment. One is the. I'm in the middle of a board meeting. Janelle. They were just sending us a copy. Yeah. Mark. Uh, by the way, Cleo Charlene sent an email saying that she's on the call. Uh, she just couldn't find the Zoom link. Francisco has suddenly stopped working at all. I can't. I can. Everybody's grayed out. Yes. What happened? Here. The web okay. activity on my end has completely stopped. It's uh, it's not responding and frozen. Uh, I would, if that's the case, you can uh, leave the event or exit out and then re-click on the link to rejoin in. Okay, everybody can see the financial statement now? Yes, sir, sure can. Yeah. Okay. All right, as I was saying earlier, this is we're going over the uh, December uh, financial statement now. On this balance sheet, you can see that as of the end of December, we had not quite uh, 16.4 million dollars uh, in the bank, uh, 596000 of that being in our checking account and the other $15.7 million in our local government investment pool. Uh, let's see, how do I get from page to page now? Okay, there we go. There. Here's the second page. <laughs> All right. Trying to figure out how to make it a little wider here so y'all can see it. Um, all right, can you see that okay? Yes, sir. All right, if we look at the, the various transactions during the month of December, let's see, the first few here, um, down through Motorola, just normal monthly bills. Uh, back in November, we started paying uh, Will Denomini for his uh, lobbyist services. Same here in December. We pay him $6,250 a month. Uh, this uh, uh, expense for winter workshop, the 901 Center here has uh, eight people that, that are going to be going to Gatlinburg for this winter workshop uh, uh, event that's taking there regarding uh, you know the 901 industry. Um, the call one was for some radio equipment, uh, that's $1,684. Watson Furniture was for various parts and pieces to go ahead and uh, fix some of the uh, console furniture around here. Eye in the Sky is a, a camera and some uh, labor that went into, actually a couple cameras and some labor that went in to repairing or installing them. Uh, of course, DBL Siegenthaler, that's uh, a, a normal monthly expense. That includes several months there. That's why it's as high as it is, 86000 AT&T, there's another one that's uh, that's normal. And uh, you see here this million dollars. So that was for that annual payment that we agreed to pay Metro for the, um, the uh, re radio replacements where we agreed to give them a million dollars over the next million dollars a year over the next five years. So that was due by the first of the, of this year. So that that's our payment for this first year. And then let's see, you can see that uh, we had interest in our checking account of a little over $19. Uh, we had two EBID checks that we got from Metro. 
one being for $1,884 and the other for $320 for various pieces of equipment that was uh, surplused. We, during December, we also got our um, our um, the, um, the uh, funding for the um, 911 surcharge fees. Okay, let's. Uh, I'm gonna. That's going backwards. I'll practice a little more next time before we do this. Okay, here's our profit and loss statement. You can see here during. During uh, December, we or yeah, during December we had income of uh, one million one hundred eighteen thousand four hundred dollars. We had normal operating expenses here of uh, two hundred twenty-one thousand, and then with that million dollars, we I hope we got to jump to the next page for that. Yeah, the million dollars we paid Metro, which we uh, booked under the capital expenditures. Uh, we ended up with a uh, a net loss for the month of $102,915. And when we go over to look at, ah, sorry about this. Uh, let's, all right, here's the budget versus actual. Can you all see the full page here? Mm -hmm. No, actually, like I can't see the last column, so I don't know if you. I can't see the last column either. Okay, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to enlarge this, but anyways, we're, if you've got a copy in front of you, we're with well within budget within all the categories, so I don't see us having any problems at this point in time with being staying in budget throughout the year. So, are there any questions? I'm sorry for the uh, the difficulty here showing this. I wish we could, we just everybody had it right in front of them where we could look at it. Were there any questions regarding the December statement? Larry, I think I'll let you show it next time since you're not adept at this. <laughs> we could, we'll, we'll work together on it, and uh, yeah. And actually, I could I could scroll it up there and then let you talk. Can you? Okay. Okay. Were, were there any questions? I guess I have a, sh a small question on the um, the TECB surcharge. It shows we're at 43 percent for the year. Shouldn't it be at 50 percent? Did we like over budget that? Well, starting uh, at the beginning of this year, we're going to get a little. We're going to get more. Okay, so oh, gonna, that's right. That's right. Okay. We got. We have that. It goes up to the surcharge fee goes up to a dollar fifty. So we're going to get a little bit more every time we. Uh, and what we have been receiving. Okay. That's okay. For the next three months. Yeah, I forgot about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to do a motion to if accept it. If there's not any other questions or comments, a motion to approve the financial report for December is, would be appropriate. Also move. Have a motion. Was that Susan? Yes. Okay. Thought I recognized the voice. Do I have a second? A second. William. William, second. Do we have discussion on it? Not. I'm going to do a roll call vote. Uh, Susan? Yes. Lorinda? If you'd ever get back in. Okay, I'll move on and come back to Lorinda. William Johnson? Yes. Steve Anchor? David Gleason? Yes. Rick Callan? Charlene Oliver? Yes, I'm here. Uh, Elliot Trevino? Uh, <coughs> Mr. Trevino, how do you vote on the December financial statement as read? Yes. Thank you. Dorinda Hale. She must still be having difficulty. She must still be having difficulty. So we'll pass on that. Okay, there was a point made about the November financial statement. We normally don't go back, but I think yeah. we probably should. We could, yeah. Let's go back. Mark's going to put the November up, and let's go ahead and get a motion to approve it. <laughs> 
¿Cómo está? ¿Todo bien? Bien, estoy en el meeting de 911. Okay. Bye. Saludos. Bye. Bye. Now I have to figure out how to get out of this. Uh, Larry, do you want to bring up the um, the November one? Cleo, excuse me. Are you there, Lorinda? Cleo, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear yes, us? Yes, ma'am, I am. I'm San Francisco. Yes, ma'am, I can. And I, on the last vote, I had wanted to vote I, but Cisco had decided I wasn't supposed to be able to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did take a vote on the December financial statement. Do you vote yes or no? I voted yes. Thank you. We're looking for the November financial yeah, statement. Give us, just a minute. Give us just a second. Larry, yes, can, do you want to try bringing that November yes. one up? Can you hear me? Can you hear us, Larry? Yeah. Yeah, I'm working on it. I was muted. Oh, okay. How do I get out of this, I wonder? Do you have unshare at the bottom of the screen? I don't see that now. It says share, but not unshare. Hey, Brandon, are you still are you still with us, Brandon? Can uh, can you flip uh, make me the presenter? Uh, I did. You have the presenter ball right now. I get I get my uh, document to off the screen. It should kick you out whenever Larry pulls up his. Okay, thank you. We just don't do it enough. To, I know. Now bear with us for a minute. Dang it. <laughs> it's, uh, I guess you can see it, but it's turned sideways probably, isn't it? Yes. Dang it. Well, every, everybody saw a copy of it last month. Say, everybody got a copy and should have had an opportunity to review it. Did you have questions or issues that we needed to talk about on the November statement? Are y'all comfortable if we make a motion to accept as presented in the uh, yeah, what was sent out to us? I'll make that motion. I'll oh, second. Ruby made a motion and Lorinda seconds. Is that correct? Right? No, that was made the someone else made the motion. Susan, okay. Susan made the motion. Okay, thank you, Susan. Who seconded it? Lorinda, Lorinda. seconded the motion. Yeah. Okay. We're going to do another roll call vote. So I'm going to name the list, starting with Susan. Aye. Lorinda. Okay, move on and come back. Ruby Baker. Aye. Rick Cowan. Aye. Charlene Oliver. Aye. Elliot Trevino. Aye. Um, back up to William Johnson. Aye. Yes. So, Thank you. Yes. It, it did. So we have taken care of the financial uh, statements for both the month of November and the month of December. Can you see it now, Mark? Does it look right? Is it right side up now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to go through any of it, or? Well, thank you. We we can flip through it real quick here. Um, yeah, here on the balance sheet, it showed that we had about 16.4 million at the end of November. Uh, Let's see. We need to get, get go to page two. We had some some big expenses though. If I how did you advance the page, Mark? 
over on the left hand side there's uh there's little arrows it shows it's on page one now okay up oh, <laughs> it's sideways again I, I figured I'd have to do fix that now, though. Thanks. Okay. All right. You got it. Are you standing on your head? <laughs> All right. <laughs> A couple big expenditures during the month. Um, if you look here, we paid our Ever Everbridge maintenance. It was 100, almost $147,000. That's that annual maintenance that we, we pay on that uh, product. And then we also, if, you, if we look down here, we paid our uh, paid Entrado, the annual maintenance on the Entrado telephone system, which was almost 297,000. Uh, but then during the month too, we we, we took in um, our excess uh, revenue from from the TCB was 755,000. Um, and then we also had that controller grant payment, that 196,000 that we were expecting. Um, and this two hundred fifty thousand dollars, I, I was, I didn't know if we were going to get this in time to pay our bills. Uh, I didn't know if we were going to get the TEC B money in time, so I moved two hundred fifty from our LGIP account into our checking account. That's why you see two hundred fifty thousand dollars going into one and out of the other. Um, so those were the were the various expenditures. Then you can, if you want to jump over to that profit and loss uh, page, Larry, we'll look at that real quick. And, Hey, during during the month of November, you can see that we uh, income was nine hundred fifty nine thousand, and then as we scroll down, we had uh, expenses six hundred ninety four thousand, almost six hundred ninety five. Did we have anything under capillary? Scroll down a little, another a little more page. Yeah, I probably did. Yep. Larry and I will do a little more practicing on this before before the next virtual meeting. Yeah, there was no, nothing under the capital side, so we finished the month uh, with a two hundred sixty-four thousand dollar gain. And there again, all, we were within budget and everything. So, everybody comfortable with that? Yes. Uh, training requests. As far as I know, we don't have any. No, don't. Who said there were none this month? Miss Quito, I do. I do have one, Mark. I'm sorry. We, uh, okay. We we talked, and I got caught in the hallway talking to Paul, and and we do have a uh, a portion of of the expenses associated with our transition from uh, uh, Pro QA or International Academy of Emergency Dispatch, not the software piece, but the training uh, piece of teaching our folks the new uh, the new protocols. Uh, Larry, I send that to everybody. The quote that we received, and Larry, if you've got that and want to just uh, share it. For this discussion, that is an email I just uh, just sent maybe in the last five minutes or so. What we're doing is we're making a migration away from uh, International Academy of Emergency Dispatch, the Pro QA, uh, pre arrival protocols for emergency medical and fire, uh, transitioning to the APCO solution, which is uh, it moves away from. Uh, what well, we have a, a, a protocol-based solution that, that uh, International Academy uses to uh, a criteria-based solution. Uh, says you're reporting these general type of symptoms instead of us asking very, very, very detailed questions to try to diagnose the, the solution. Uh, we ask more broad questions to identify the symptoms, which help. Uh, and when we align with fire department and EMS, uh, they're saying based on these symptoms, we want to send these types of. Uh, there we go. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we want to send these, this type of response to these types of symptoms. Um, and that includes not only uh, medical, but law enforcement and fire as well. Uh, it's going to reduce uh, our, our total number of, of case incident types. We've got about 3,500 incident types in our system now. This will reduce us down to probably closer to 250 to 300. It increases our ability to act quickly to get responders on the road uh, to the incidents that are being reported to us rather than uh, the laboring callers with a whole lot uh, of additional questions that are honestly not impacting the response. We're, we're asking more questions and it doesn't impact uh, who we're sending. We can, so we get uh, resources on the road faster. We can send notifications more, uh, more efficiently through our CAD system to a variety of responders, whoever wants to, uh, to know 
about an incident that occurred, fire chiefs, fire marshals, those types of folks can get text messages that say, hey, this incident is happening in this location. Uh, instead of uh, you know, the current solution we're using really convolutes that process. Uh, this is something that I've been requested to do, uh, move away from the, the ProQA solution and into a, an alternate uh, criteria-based dispatch solution by the fire department, by emergency medical services, by our medical director, Dr. Slovis, uh, and, and then internally as well. Uh, since I showed up here, but we've been waiting to make sure that that's the right move and not just the, the hasty move. Uh, it's consistent with, with the way I function everywhere else I've been. I'm not a, a huge fan of the International Academy uh, product and, and ultimately will save us uh, about half in, in the annual maintenance uh, for, for the software if we decide to implement the software. Our current software costs are about $44,000 a year annual maintenance. If we move forward with the APCO's software solution, it'll be $20,000 a year annual maintenance. Uh, and if we decide to do something homegrown uh, with our own CAD system, which is an option, it would probably be uh, uh, no annual maintenance associated with the software solution, which is as well. Uh, the cost associated with uh, procuring the, the, the guide cards and the questions that we would ask for these types of calls, uh, as well as training up our instructors to, to teach emergency medical dispatch, uh, fire and law enforcement, which we already do with some of the other uh, half of classes we teach, is $34,647.17 uh, in, in pieces paid over the next uh, couple of months. So that's uh, the request to charge against line 4418 there for training as we train our up in this uh, alternate solution away from the, uh, the International Academy of Emergency Dispatch solution we're currently using today. Steve, you said it would be thirty-four thousand from our training budget. Is that what? Yep, thirty-four thousand six forty-seven. Okay. Your folks have looked at it, and they—I uh, don't have a copy of that budget right here in front of me, but they—they they feel confident that they'll, they'll still stay within budget in that in the in the um, training budget. I know yep. we had what, over three hundred thousand, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I was seeing right now we've got about eighty three, eighty five thousand, something like that remaining uh in on that line. Um this oh, that line, point, okay. we only have one more academy we're starting uh between now and the end of the fiscal year. They start on Monday. Uh and we don't expect uh many if, if if any additional training costs for the rest of the fiscal year. Yeah, okay, I'm looking at it now. I got I got that budget in front of me. Yeah, I think that that, that should work okay. Anybody have any other questions or comments? I see Susan's hand. I don't is there not? Uh, I have a question. Susan? Um, is there not a fee to use the system or the software or user fee? Um, if, where's the cost of that? I don't see it. Yeah, if we move forward with the software, there would be a, a cost, and we'll bring that to you separately. We're not sure that we're going to do the software uh, yet. I think it's a... The software, we're quoted $120,000 uh, uh, of an, an initial installation, kind of initial one-time setup uh, cost and process, and then the ongoing annual maintenance for that is $20,000 a, a year. Uh, but we are not sold on, on moving forward with the software at this time. We're still investigating that piece. If you did something, you think it'd be next year? Software. I don't understand. Uh, $34,000 if we're not going to move forward with the software. I'm sorry, I'm getting parts of the questions. Mark, your question is to timeline. The, the software, if we do do that, would be after the first of the fiscal year for sure. So that'd be okay, so it's falling next year. Okay. That'd be a new budget. Um, Susan and Lorinda, it sounds like you guys are asking the same question that says, why purchase this if we're not going to go with the other half of it? Is that accurate? <laughs> is it, is yes. That Okay, uh, there is options or opportunity with our existing Premier One CAD that we can provide, we can do the same function currently pro provided through the ProQA external software. We can use our CAD uh, to do that natively. So we can provide the same results without the added cost of using an outside third-party software vendor. Um, APCO offers a solution called Intellicom. Uh, we're just not sure that it offers more functionality than what we can do already inside of our own CAD system, uh, working with Motorola to, to, to help the Premier One CAD system do and provide the same process. 
linked questions associated with call types. And we say, we get the calls, here's our list of questions, and it pops up in front of the dispatcher to get to ask the questions and give the appropriate instructions. But, uh, you're on this, it looks like we're paying to have at least two or three people uh, like to teach this. Is it totally software, or is there some ongoing licensing thing that we're paying at least for what we're seeing here on that? No, there's no ongoing licensing fee associated with, with this here. This is separate from the software. This is training the material, right? The questions you would ask, how you would process the call, and teaching those classes they're required to take. Uh, and we're doing this right now with, with uh, uh, International Academy of Emergency Dispatch. You provide uh, a law enforcement training, uh, I'm sorry, not law enforcement, they don't do that. Uh, emergency medical dispatch class and a fire training class. They, they Our folks, we have uh, uh, Don Perry and Mark uh, Hutchison, are trained instructors in that course. Uh, we're just migrating them from teaching those classes to these APCO classes. And our annual ongoing maintenance is uh, $30 per person every two years to recertify in these courses. So it's a, a nominal fee. Mm -hmm. So if you do it yourself through um, your existing, I guess, system, I mean, does that protect all the liability and such like that? Can you? Uh, Absolutely. When we when we work with APCO, uh, the, the, the criteria-based dispatch process is uh, licensed under your local medical director. Rather than, if you look at ProQA solution, they have a, uh, a single solution that is a one-size-fits-all from Calgary to, to Key West, and everybody follows into this process. Everybody asks the same questions. Everybody follows the same uh, directions all over the, the country, whether it makes sense for your area or not. And that's how uh, how the ProQA software, National International Academy of Emergency Dispatch, will um, back you up, will support your support you in court. Um, inside of this process, as long as your medical director signs off on the guide cards and supports the guide cards that you're using, then you fall under the protection of your of your medical director. It actually aligns your your medical protocols and the information you're giving with the way. Uh, the, in line with the rest of the medical uh, response system inside of the county. And this is, uh, uh, I have talked to Dr. Slovis, Corey Slovis, about this, and he has, uh, have his full support uh, for this transition. And I guess I would so move that we authorize the purchase of this, uh, of this program for protocol from APCO by use of the ECB. Second by David. Oh, sorry. Okay, Lorinda has made a motion to approve the training request. I'm sorry, I didn't hear who second. David. David, thank you. I'm uh, second by David. I'm going to call for the vote here in a minute. After you give me your vote, would everybody try to mute their phones? There's a lot of uh, static uh, forming and people are having trouble. So I'll, I'll try to give you plenty of time to ask a question before I call for the vote going forward. With that being said, is everybody ready? Yes. Uh, um, I'll, I'm going to do the roll call, and if you're for it, yes, and if you're not, no. Starting with Susan Matson. Yes. Lorinda Hale. William Johnson. Yes. Ruby Baker. Yes. David Gleason. Rick Cowan. Yes. Charlene Oliver. Aye. And Elliot Trevino. Yes. Okay, the ayes have it. It's approved. Thank you very much. Uh, up next is public awareness. Philip. Yes. Hello. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Good to, good to see everyone and hear everyone after, after so long. Um, I believe my colleagues Stephanie and Tiffany are also on the line, and uh, I'm going to pass the baton uh, to them for respective pieces of this. Um, and uh, first and foremost, I know Stephanie is excited to report on our advertising uh, program, and uh, and and uh, I'll with that pass it over to Stephanie. Hi everyone. 
So our this uh, December will be the last month that we have this campaign running. All of our new creative and the new advertising campaign started on the fourth. So um, hopefully you'll see some some new metrics starting with our board meeting next month. But um, for the last month on the on the old campaign, we continue to perform very well. Click through on the digital ads are more than double the national average. And we drove over to the, to the site um, in December. So everything's looking still really good, and I hope to see those numbers get better with new perspective. All the new billboards are up, everything, all the new radio is running. So we'll um, take a look at, at what that looks like next month. Um, and additionally, we're working now on uh, producing the video. Um, have that out and running um, into February and early March. And that's all I have. If nobody has any questions. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and then uh, the other piece of our report has to do with the Rescue X program. Um, I can hit the highlights, and, and then Tiffany, please jump in on anything that I miss. We're um, pleased that our animated um, our, our animated video is complete and uh, ready for uh, distribution with our with our uh, Davidson County Schools. Um, you all should have gotten a link to that in, in the report. It was a Dropbox link, Dropbox link, so I, I understand that maybe some of you couldn't access that. So. Um, if we haven't already, uh, we will get you another option. I, I think we have a YouTube link we can share uh, with that video. Um, but um, it, so with that, we have uh, started the process of reaching out to schools and coordinating um, uh, participation in the animated version of the REX program. We sent out a mass um, email last week to all Davidson County schools um, that we've that we've worked with in the past and, and received a strong immediate response. We got a, about 20 schools that right away expressed interest in participating. Uh, we'll be following up with that email to to generate more um, participation participation in the program. Um, but um, we'll be working with the schools individually in terms of coordinating logistics for. Um, Getting them the materials that um, that come with the with the video, the um, specifically the coloring book and or the PDF version of the coloring book. Um, we want to make sure that, that those are available for them, and and we'll coordinate with them individually in terms of how we'll get those into their students' hands. Um, Quick question: Are you allowing individual teachers to uh, respond to you, or it must be on a fully school based. Uh, I've had a couple of teachers at a couple of the elementary schools around me ask if they could get it for their individual classrooms, which is 25 to 30 kids, as opposed to because they don't do group, well, they do some type of group meeting, but it's not, it's not really functional for this type of program yet. Uh, that's a good question. And, and Tiffany, you might be better. Um, capable of responding to that. I know typically we have to reach out to principals uh, and, and do the classes all together, but since they're since we're doing them individually with classes, I don't believe we do individual teacher outreach, but I could be wrong about that. No, you no, know, what I'm asking is can can it be done by individual can we drop box it to an individual teacher for them to be able to use it? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, we can do that. Um I, I, I think again that's part of the logistics we'll be working out per per school and per class. I know for example, my kids go to Glendale Elementary and they have on their patio out front a, a crate for each each classroom for yeah. materials yeah. for their students. And so in that case, we could probably just Deliver the books to each teacher's classroom and put them in the put, it, put them in their crate or whatever they have to, to the material. Yeah. Uh, so, and I, but I think each school does it a little different, and and so that that's one of those logistics that we'll just have to work on an individual basis. Okay. But yes, Lorenda, this is Tiffany. You can for sure pass along the Dropbox, and we'll get we'll be in contact with the teacher, individual teacher, to take care of the needs. Well.
Yeah, I had a couple asked because they wanted to get the workbooks and at I know two of the elementary schools out here, they're putting packages in weekly that the teachers are actually delivering to students homes. Uh, I mean, talk about folks going above and beyond, they are. Uh, they were asking yeah. if they could get that in time to deliver it before they did the lesson with the kids. So I told them I would ask. That's great. Yeah, we'll, we'll be sure, certainly any any teacher that that requests them, we'll, we're going to do everything possible to get them in their hands. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, you know, this is kind of uncharted territory for us as well in terms of how we're doing this, but uh, certainly our goal is to get as many of these coloring books in, in the hands of, of students and, and uh, hopefully have them watch the video as well. Thank you. And we'll, and we'll track that, and that's part of the – that's part of what we'll be doing with this as well. The, the website has a form that we're asking them to fill out so that we can track uh, participation. Uh, so that will that will help with that as well. Um, otherwise, um, we'll, we're in the process of developing a social media content calendar that helps us promote the animated uh, video. So we'll be using Facebook to promote it to make sure. Uh, that, that others uh, are, are aware of, of it, uh, and, and even those who aren't in, in a metro classroom can have access to it to, uh, to sort of meet our education program outside of the outside of the school. Um, that I think, and Tiffany, unless I missed anything, those I think are the highlights. Very good. Thank you. Very much. Up next is we have a request of renaming a section of Clover Street to Community Court. It's extending from 44th Avenue North to a dead end between Centennial Boulevard, Dr. Walter S. Davis Boulevard, and Tennessee Avenue, all of which is more particularly described by lines, words, figures on the desk, which they attached. I'm assuming everything is on the up. And I've talked to the Marty Boyd. Um, uh, Boys here in, in the 9-1 center, and he said uh, he's agreeable to this name change. Okay, we're going to do a roll call vote after I get a motion and a second. I'll so move. I have a motion for Lorenda. I'll second. And a second from Ruby. Do we have any discussion? Questions? All right, moving down the list. A yes for if you agree and no if you do not. Susan? Susan? Sorry, I forgot I was muted. Um, yes. Lorenda? Yes. William Johnson? Yes. Ruby Baker? David Gleason? Yes. Rick Cowan? Yes. Charlene Oliver? Yes. And Elliot Trevino? Yes. Thank you. It is approved. Uh, next up is uh, Director Stephen Martini's uh, report. Again, I want to thank you, Steve, for sending out the information that you've sent to us. I want to extend again. I know I've sent you uh, emails thanking everybody for their outstanding work. Uh, the uh, explosion downtown was traumatic and Everything that I've been able to read and, and ascertain, everybody here did everything within their power. And outstanding job on cutting over to the camera trunks. Yay! <laughs> and uh, I just uh, I just appreciate it, and I'm sure every, the citizens of Nashville does, too. So up until you go into the Brentwood Data Center and knocking on the door to get in. So I'll let you give us your report. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we absolutely did uh, everything we could possibly think of and, and inside and outside and around the box, and we built a new box and stood outside of that. As much as we could possibly do, we uh, we did uh, that night. And i got to say, it's a, it was a team effort uh, over multiple days, and I'm very, very, very pleased with our Entrado uh, technician, uh, Easton Smith, uh, who, who replaced Phil Long in, uh, in July after Phil's uh, – I'm sorry, not Phil Long, Phil Neal uh, – after Phil's retirement. And, uh, and he did a great job quickly identifying that our 911 calls were, were inconsistently uh, performing and getting us on those camera trunks when it was still an option. It was a, it was a big deal, and I really, really appreciated that. Uh, it kept us up for those three days, even though we lost some other, other items. Um, I do have a pretty lengthy uh, re report. Um, 
Phil McGowan, are you still uh, on the call? Oh, I'm up there. Uh, we have a customer satisfaction survey that was completed in uh, October and presented in October, our annual customer service uh, satisfaction survey. I did not intend to, to uh, report on it because uh, we uh, wasn't sure what was what was us and what was you, Phil. So if it's uh, if it's you, I'll stay out. If it's me, I'll do it. Oh, go for it, uh, director. <laughs> All right. Uh, Kind of falls into into or it has fallen into coordinated through I think y'all y'all's group and I appreciate that we got this uh, this result back which is uh, great. Um, Phil, no, not Phil. Forgive me, Larry. Do I have the ability to present or share my screen, or can we coordinate with Miss Brandon to do so? Uh, yeah, Brandon can make you the presenter. <laughs> nice job, Brandon. Well done. All right, quick. Uh, all right, so the first item, there we go. Can you all see that okay? Well, there we go. That's what you're seeing. Great. Y'all are seeing the customer satisfaction survey results? Yes, sir. Super. Um, skip through this. I will email this out so everybody has access uh, to it. Kind of the highlights, our key findings, we found that uh, Kind of a mix, not much change year over year, honestly. Kind of a mix of uh, about half the people surveyed uh, called the 8600 number, the other half called 911, and then a small percentage, uh, uh, less than a less than a fifth, uh, called both. And year over year satisfaction rates uh, remained uh, close to an 88 percent total, which was uh, uh, close to last year's as well. We were. Um, Increase those who are very satisfied this year, 11% uh, up from, from last year. Almost three quarters of our groups uh, said they were reporting uh, uh, police emergencies, which is not surprising, and then other uh, well, one fifth of them were reporting medical emergencies, a smaller still fire or some other other uh, concern, or they don't remember what they were what they were reporting. Again, that's pretty well in line with the types of cat incidents we, we enter every year, about, about eight out of 10 incidents we uh, we enter are uh, law enforcement in nature. Uh, one of the pieces to consider as we move through, I think this one and the next one of, of how satisfied they were with the, uh, the their service or the how we you know interacted with them, the way that the the request was presented to the respondee was their level of of how happy they were with the response, the public safety response. That could also include their interaction with law enforcement on the scene, their inter interaction with the firefighters, their interaction with uh, the medics when they arrived at the scene, all the way to delivering that patient to the hospital. Uh, in, in these types of surveys to the general public, to the time I called 911, to the time uh, the, the responders left my driveway or dropped me off at the hospital is their experience with, with public safety. So uh, to get the, the respondents to really understand in detail, how were you pleased or how were you satisfied with your phone call interaction was uh, uh, noted as a challenge by the by the uh, the research team conducting the survey. We had a new question this year to say uh, whether they were reporting in their minds a high priority or a low priority incident. Uh, you'll see, uh, kind of looking here. Uh, about the majority of folks that they were reported uh, uh, emergencies on a non-emergency line, or in their head they were call calling a non-emergency number to report an emergency. Uh, medical calls, the high the high priority call uh, was the, the call to, uh, you see their law enforcement, right? I'm sorry, I bumped, bumped my hand. The law enforcement call, 69% of people said they were reporting a a high emergency, 26% of people said they called 911 said it was a low emergency. 8,600, a little over half said, oh, it was a, a low low emergency call, but still about almost 40%. So they were reporting something they would consider as a, a high emergency on that 8,600 number. Uh, we've had a little bit of education uh, to do since November. It's kind of convenient. We did this survey on folks who called in, in August, September, October. Then we made the change to 8600 to prompt calls, not prompt, but uh, advise callers of the option to report uh, other calls or non-emergency nature calls to uh, 
<clears throat> to 311. And there's a about a two-minute message, automated message. It's on the beginning of 8600 when you call now, just advising those <laughs> options. I've had maybe four people share a concern over the last uh, three months uh, about the wait or the, the amount of time. And when they advised what they were calling about, which I thought was really interesting, uh, when they advised what they were calling about, uh, one of them said they saw somebody actively being kicked out of a moving car and they thought the message uh, on 8600 was too long for that type of emergency. I encourage that person in the future to call 911. That's, that is a 911 reportable emergency and not 8600. Uh, we had another similar uh, story that said, you know, there was a, a road hazard in the middle of the road and there were cars that were driving at a high rate of speed trying to, to dodge this road hazard and they felt like the, uh, the, the, the message in front of 8600 was too long. And again, I would encourage that person. In that moment where there's something laying actively in the road and cars are trying to dodge and move around it, call 911. Uh, so the good news is we've done a great job encouraging callers to try to avoid calling 911. Now we've got to kind of re-educate them a little bit of when it's okay to call 911 uh, in those moments. But other than those four concerns, uh, really we've not heard any other negatives, and we've seen great positives in reduction of our calls to 8,600 uh, by about 300 to 400 calls a day less than where we were in October, uh, which help our, our call takers get to those 911 calls faster, stay on those calls longer, uh, giving those those folks calling 911 the, the, the more the, the intimate and more appropriate response that they need, uh, which has been really great. And then we continue to flesh out a partnership with 311 that I'll, uh, I'll talk about uh, later. So that was interesting information here. Uh, and this question was, if they didn't require police, fire, EMS, or for medical support, uh, how many were referred to somebody else? And, and we found here most of the folks were not referred to call uh, someone else. About three out of four were not referred to, to, uh, to some other service, which is uh, helpful and also encouraged me to, to put in a message in front of our, uh, our 8600 line, because if we are one in four calls referring those to some other service, then it's uh, helpful to catch those up front and direct those callers to another another service, so we're not tying up dispatchers who need to be answering 911 calls to give recommendations and referrals to other agencies. <clears throat> yeah, we have a concern here that says DEC operators didn't, ex didn't explain the process. Now that you've called us, who's coming? Uh, so we took this as a note. Uh, for in-service training going forward to address with our folks to really take the time to explain when a caller calls, not just answer the 911 call and ask their questions, but give them an expectation of what's happening next. Who's going to come to your house? Who's going to come to your scene? What do you expect uh, next? I can see that as 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 an issue, and I can see is uh, with, with our turnover rate that we saw uh, in, in the, the spring and into the new, uh, hiring as many new folks as we have, I can see that those folks staying very focused on the questions you ask and not necessarily uh, quality pre-arrival instructions, which include who to expect. Most respondents said that we were courteous, which we appreciate that one too. 92% say that the, the person they, met, they spoke with uh, was courteous, which is a huge success and consistent with the last uh, five years. They claim that we did well obtaining their information, which is, uh, again, great and consistent with previous years. Their largest complaint was that we struggled to determine uh, their location. That is hopefully remedied by our process so far. We have added about 4,000 um, common places, locations inside of our CAD system. So McDonald's, Taco Bell, Walmart, uh, uh, those types of locations have been added into our, call, our CAD system so the dispatcher can simply type the name of the location and it will give a potential address or potential addresses of those commonplace locations. So if somebody says, I'm on Murfreesboro Road in front of the Starbucks, we can quickly type in Starbucks, get a list of all the Starbucks in, in Davidson County and find those that are on Murfreesboro Road to help us narrow down which one they're in front of, find other uh, you know, are you near this street or are you near this other business? We've got those businesses also identified on the map with a logo of their uh, of their business on top of that, that that building, which I think is fantastic. Gives our dispatchers a quick look. If I see a just a map of buildings or a, a square of an intersection, I can also see 
there's a Starbucks, there's a Taco Bell next to it, and there's a, a, a Lowe's or a Home Depot across the street. All of these common places when people aren't sure of their address, uh, like most of us aren't, if I get in a car wreck on the street, I don't know the numerical address of the, you know, when I get hit. All I know is I'm in front of a Taco Bell. So that uh, hopefully will help our folks um, migrate away from some of this here where they were struggling with or tripping over uh, finding a location of an incident when a caller calls to report it. I suspect that's a, a large part of what's driving uh, some of those those challenges. Hey, Director Martini. Sir. Uh, David Gleason here. Hey, uh, I've come across a, uh, a company called NG911 Services, uh, started up by a gentleman named Don Mitchell. He used to be with uh, TCS, and I worked with him in the past. But um, I'll, I'll send you some of his information. Uh, he's created an uh, algorithm with uh, syncing up with the wireless carriers, and when they send that information, uh, so you don't have to do so much searching. It might be something for us to look at. So, yeah, I'd be glad to investigate that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, some of the folks that called and said they were uh, they were not satisfied or had a concern was was uh, response times. How quickly folks showed up to their house to uh, to take care of their their issue uh, potentially. Right. We don't know if that's only it. It could have been how long the phone rang. Um, Hopefully not. Our 911 calls, our call times have only improved since uh, since we've added staff uh, in, in here to, to answer the calls. To address some of this, part of our partnership with Hub Nashville and sending very low tier calls, low priority calls through um, Hub Nashville to get reports for, for example, we had a lady who ordered a license plate. And it was supposed to come in the mail, and it never showed up, so it was stolen out of the mail, and she needed a police report. Prior to utilizing uh, uh, Hub Nashville to report this tag lost, she would have to call 8600, wait in the queue, talk to one of our dispatchers who's running, trying to answer other 911 calls, or uh, put, on her, put her on hold so that we can get to uh, 911 calls that may come in once she answers which gives her a horrible customer service experience because we're bouncing back and forth and telling her that her emergency is not priority, right? Uh, and that leads to things like this. Uh, it took a long time for them to answer my phone. When they did, I was treated like I wasn't a priority and I had a frustrating experience. So working with Hub Nashville allows folks to go online, enter their, their tags stolen saying, this didn't show up, I need a police report for that. We can still get that to a dispatcher and still route that to an appropriate uh, location with police to get a report number for her so that, so that uh, citizen is served without tying up the phone lines and, and causing a, a, a slow response for her or a delayed response for, uh, for others. Also, by doing that, we don't have to dispatch a police officer in the field to go to her house and make a report, drive to her location, and fill it all out to give her a report number, which is all she needs for insurance so she can get a replacement tag. Um, which frees up those officers to make responses to other locations faster because they're not tied up driving across the county for calls uh, like this that aren't not important. They're just not as priority for other uh, other types of events. So ultimately, we're pretty sure this this partnership with with Hub Nashville is going to really pan out not just for us but for the police department and seeing marked uh, reduction in response times because they're not tying up some of their their road resources responding to things uh, that that don't require an officer to drive to your house to, to take care of. Let's see, less than satisfied callers, again, it's a pretty small, um, pretty small number. Within that 14% that or so that said they were not, or 12% said they weren't satisfied uh, when they said why, they're saying 41% said what I called, I, did, I just didn't get help with what I was calling for. Uh, again, my active theory says 8,600 is the, is the the place, and really you see that 52% of people that said I called 8600 and you didn't, I didn't get the help I was calling for. Uh, it has become over time the one-stop shop, 10-digit number, 24 hours a day, number you call to complain about all things Metro government. If you're not sure who to call, you call 8600 because it's the number you know. Uh, by working with 311, we're able to get callers who say I have some problem inside of city services, whatever that is, maybe it's trash pickup, maybe it's a pothole that's in my road, maybe it's a, a manhole cover that hasn't been replaced. Getting those people 
in touch or connected to the appropriate department to solve their problem uh, is really going to move forward in solving those those issues where people feel like I called and they couldn't help me because uh, and and I, I learned this through conversations uh, one with Aaron uh, Aaron Williams over the mayor's office where she says well just anything somebody could think of that's a problem or a potential problem in, in Nashville they call 8600 right isn't that the way you guys do and then you put them in touch with the right person and I, I sort of spent the last four months or so educating if you don't need a police officer, a firefighter, or a medic to show up at your house, we are not the right people to call. <laughs> if you need traffic engineering to look at a blinking stoplight near your house, uh, 311 is the right number to call, and they will put you in contact with the right uh, the right city resource. And uh, Otherwise, I'm just going to dispatch a firefighter or a police officer out there to that blinking light so they can say, yep, it's blinking. We need to contact traffic engineering. Again, it's slowing down the officer, and it's taking a while to get to the right solution. So. I'm really, really excited, if you can't tell, about this Hub Nashville <laughs> partnership. I think it's going to be a great thing for citizens and, and then ultimately a great thing for, for us as well. Let's see, other increased, uh, one here, 911, we asked too many questions. Again, that's going to be solved uh, moving away from the ProQA solution that gets very in the weeds with the types of call, the types of questions we have to ask, even if it's not relevant, even if the caller has already answered it, even if, it's, if it doesn't feel uh, associated to the call, to be in compliance legally with the ProQA software, our folks have to ask every question that's listed in that, in that, uh, under that case type, uh, whether they need to or feel like they should or not. So to avoid getting a negative QA score, they're asking questions that really feel belaboring to the caller. This is, uh, was, was my experience previously and definitely Medical Director Slovis' concern that says, can we move away from this? We're, we're, we're patronizing or frustrating callers when they call in and asking questions they don't need the answers to. So this, I think our move to the APCO uh, uh, criteria-based dispatch is going to see a reduction in that they ask too many questions uh, uh, category because I, I, I feel that very deeply. Confusion over location, I talked about how we're remedying that uh, as well. Folks that were satisfied with the DEC, uh, only half say their experience was uh, Let's see, only a less than half say their experience was positive or that changes were required. So changes that were recommended among those folks who say they, they could have had a better experience, um, let's see, 40% said everything was good. So of the 60 that said it could have been better, uh, improving communication from or training to the operator, I think we look at that line, if you're having problems finding me or you're asking me too many questions, this can feel like this person needs to be trained better. Uh, again, I think we've identified that by, I know that that person needs better resources at their fingertips to find the location, and we've done that by adding common places, and they need to have uh, a resource that doesn't require them to ask uh, unnecessary questions or too many questions that can make the person sound, well, if they knew their job, why are they asking me so many questions? Well, it's because our software requires them to ask so many questions, so let's change the, the process and, and streamline that a little bit. Uh, the other highlighted note here is uh, reducing the wait time on the phones. Uh, again, I think we're going to successfully move into a reduction of, of wait time on the phones by introducing an option for people who say, I don't need to talk to somebody on the phone to report my concern. I can, I can go online. We have a variety. I think we've built out about seven now uh, kind of test categories. Uh, if somebody Hmm. Ran into your mailbox while you're away from your house. It's property damage. You need a report to replace or repair your, your, your mailbox, but you have no idea who did it. There's no suspect information. Uh, now it, it's an option for people to go on to the Hub Nashville app or the website, put in their address, list in that their, their mailbox was damaged, they don't know who did it, and they need a police report to, to, to make that, to take care of that. That request is going to come to our dispatchers who will see that through the web portal live and, and in charge and send an officer as they would appropriately responding to the caller or the person who submitted the request that we're going to send, you know, law enforcement is aware and they're going to take care of this request. All that is still being taken care of without that, without that phone call. So I think introducing alternate options to uh, citizens to report their concerns is going to resolve uh, that wait time concern. That's a highlight view of this report. I will send it to all so you have it and can ask additional uh, questions. Are there any, any questions of me on, on this piece of it? Hearing none, let me move on. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, I'm sorry. So many directors report pieces. That's just one of them. I've got uh, I've got line after line. If you're, let's see. Let's share the the next item. I wanted to talk about the. Not do. Yeah, there it is. Oh, they're not seeing that anymore. You're seeing. What are you seeing? It's a good question. You should see my report now, yeah? Quick staffing requests, AT&T outage. Yes, you see it. That's the one. Staffing Great. Report. Great. That's where I was trying to get to. Uh, so we're, we're well on well on target with our staffing, which is great. Uh, I'm going to highlight here the, the Christmas Day response. Uh, we handled, <laughs> it was quite a quite an impact. Uh, from 10 a.m. to, to 7.30 p.m. on Sunday, uh, we saw uh, 26 times more uh, calls received without alley records attached, uh, which was a, a, a challenge, right? That's calls coming in without addresses associated uh, or phone numbers, for that matter, for the, the, the caller. Uh, we utilized that rapid SOS software during that outage uh, for that three-day period which did and, and functions separately. It comes across a different uh, network than AT&T and provides us real-time location of the caller. Uh, and, and as they move, we utilize that software to identify the caller, their location, their phone number, and if somebody called and hung up before they got a hold of us, uh, you know, if they called it rang once and they disconnected, we were able to call those individuals back uh, using Verizon flip phones, kind of burner phones that were positioned at each of the, uh, the consoles before this, just in case something like this ever happened, they were able to use these Verizon phones to make outbound phone calls to those callers and continue to offer help, uh, which was incredible. So 26 times more uh, than our normal monthly average of calls without uh, alley data, twice the number of our 911 calls in that three uh, than a normal month. Uh, we had uh, one and a half more uh, times more uh, calls that abandoned after five seconds. That five second number is Somebody rings, if you, if you call and let the phone ring once, typically from the time you initiate the phone call to the time we get it ringing one time on our side is about five seconds or so at the longest. So I look for calls that ring longer than five seconds so that we know that it at least rang once for the dispatcher to give them a, a notification that they had a call, right, to answer. Uh, and then 28 times more abandoned calls uh, in that time period than we had in uh, uh, in a normal month or in your average month, which is again quite uh, abandoned calls not called back. Forgive me, uh, and that that process is just recognizing that they called in the first place, right? If we don't get them and don't see them and don't have a number associated with uh, with the number that they were calling from, identifying them in separate software and and uh, and calling them back was a challenge. I don't think that those calls were not called back. That software simply simply measures did we call them back inside of our phone software. Well, we received the call on 911, but to make an outbound call, we have to have an administrative line to make that call on. All of our administrative lines were down. As soon as AT&T facility lost power around midday on Friday, uh, no 10-digit dialing was happening outside of the Entrado Viper. So the Viper could track that we received calls, but it couldn't track if we made those calls back. We were making those phone calls back on those Verizon burner phones, which isn't captured inside of this reporting data because it's completely separate phone system uh, by design, right? Completely separate, redundant, uh, not dependent on, on any carrier or on a particular carrier to, to continue. So I'm sure we made those phone calls back. It just wasn't representative inside of our data. Any questions on our Christmas response and the, the summary that I sent out? I appreciate you uh, uh, sharing, sharing about uh, our response. It was a, a, harrowed, a harried three days. So I appreciate your comments. In the coming months, probably next month, maybe March, uh, we expect to bring uh, some costs associated with conversations we're having with Williamson and, and uh, Rutherford counties to put in place a redundant fiber ring between the three counties sharing our phone systems. So if one person's phone system goes phone down and the other one is up, we'll have the capacity to maybe publish an alternate 10-digit number. If we would have had this ability that weekend to say, instead of 8600, call this 10-digit number, and it was hosted maybe on the city of Brentwood site or hosted at the Rutherford County, if they call that number and it rings their system, 
and they're able to point that phone number back across some dark fiber that we have, and THP has some of this fiber, we have some of this fiber already existing uh, with our, our shared radio system with Williamson County. If they could have pointed those phones back across that fiber connection, uh, we, we could have potentially had ringing phones uh, either inbound and outbound, the ability to make an outbound call and the ability to receive some calls uh, back into our center later that same day uh, coming through uh, central offices that weren't affected. Honestly, that, that big building downtown, that 2nd Avenue building, not only served as the, as the single touch point for 911, it served as our central office in Davidson County. While other counties surrounding us uh, had different central offices, so they could make those 10-digit or, or, or 7-digit local calls and never go through the downtown Nashville area to be impacted. Uh, we're, we're looking at that solution. It may cost some money to put those, uh, those, piece, those hardware pieces in place, uh, connecting fiber shots um, in Smyrna, in the Harding, at the Harding site, maybe down to Smyrna to get into Rutherford, or connecting into a THP conduit down 24 uh, to utilize some of that existing fiber. Uh, we'll have to make a couple of minor minor upgrades here at, at uh, Compton just to receive calls. We share radio communications, radio talk paths, talk information across those fi that fiber, but apparently to send uh, call data associated with addresses and all this other stuff, it takes more bandwidth across that fiber than the existing uh, the existing shot we have that, to share radio uh, radio data. So we that, so we learned uh, late in the night into early morning Saturday Sunday following Christmas. If we'd had those pieces there, we we could have had ringing phones about 24 hours earlier. Uh, again, 911 not impacted, but the but the others. So that's uh, that's on the horizon. It's early in the conversation yet to, to figure out what that is. But at some point, there probably will be a, a cost associated with uh, bringing some network diversity and some some redundancy into our uh, our environment to keep us from being so dependent on one carrier in the future. And uh, Director Martini, thanks for all your hard work on that. Uh, Chairwoman um, Duckworth, just for full disclosure, uh, that day I reached out to Director Martini on behalf of my company, Secular Solutions, to offer our um, cyber security device uh, because at that moment it was undetermined if it was terrorist, cyber, or just uh, you know, radical. And um, he, he considered that, but uh, were able to implement some options that they didn't feel they needed to take up the offer for us to uh, offer our services. But just full disclosure, I want that to be made known. Yep, and I do appreciate you jumping on that. Uh, on that topic, we are moving forward considering a, uh, a cyber solution. Tim Tim Watkins is out this week for some medical uh, some surgery he had done, so we won't uh, we won't be able to catch him on the call today. Uh, but I'll give an update on, on kind of where we are there. Uh, we did have a, uh, a cyber assessment completed in uh, August of last year, uh, partnering with Mission Critical Partners, uh, offered through the State Emergency Communications Board. Uh, they gave a summary of, of kind of the health of our system and some of the, 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 the weaknesses, um, not really inside of the Department of Emergency Communications, but associated with um, uh, some, some, some aspects of the Metro IT uh, network Again, not major issues, minor issues. Uh, those were shored up, uh, I think, by the end of that same week. Uh, and it was a positive experience for all involved. Uh, ongoing, we recognize the need to have uh, regular uh, cyber, monitors, cyber monitoring to make sure that we're not under a, an attack or having a threat exposed to uh, uh, our critical infrastructure. Because, yeah, something like that absolutely could cause a problem in the future. Uh, we've received quotes from Secular. Um, quote from Entrado, and I believe quotes through Mission Critical Partners, and are uh, are weighing all three of those options. Expect to make a proposal to uh, to the board in our at the February meeting on uh, an option to move forward with for cyber monitoring, customer service, Christmas bombing. Yeah. Next on my list. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Next on my list is. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, I was going to ask on the COVID situation. Are we still using Harding as a as a uh, spot for those who are COVID positive to be able to work if that's or suspected COVID positive yep. if they're wanting to, or has that gone by the wayside? No, we have we have continued to use Harding as a uh, as a 
the exposure site is the, the term we were using there. Uh, not not a lot of folks take advantage of that. I mean, one or two here or there, uh, but we do. And every time they use that site, we uh, we coordinate with uh, Premier Building uh, to follow up the, the the very within the hour after they use the site to clean uh, the shared spaces and clean the console they worked at. Uh, to make sure we stay safe out there. But uh, we're seeing a reduction in the number of COVID exposed folks we've had. We we were we made it all the way to December. It was good. And then late November into December, it, it uh, either folks were impacted by what they thought was COVID. It was about, about 60, 40. About 40% 40 of the folks who said they were symptomatic actually tested positive for COVID. About the other 60% were uh, testing for positive for something else, flu, uh, strep, pneumonia, all the different types of things that catch you when it gets cold outside. Uh, and we, we partnered with uh, the fire department and Office of Emergency Management to change our testing procedures so that our folks, if they uh, experienced symptoms, they went to get tested either that same afternoon or the following morning, and we got results uh, within 24 hours to know uh, whether they were uh, COVID positive, we needed to take different actions, or whether they were uh, uh, not sick with COVID and, and could return to work. So. It, it impacted our staffing some, for sure, through through December, uh, but we're seeing that uh, uh, reduce significantly now. We are, uh, did we get in on getting our folks vaccinated if they wanted to be? Yeah, we had about a 65% take rate on the first round. Uh, uh, those of us who, and I was I was first in line, and uh, and a couple others were, were right behind me. I think of the first uh, 10 or 12 in the door, about uh, 30 percent were DEC employees of, uh, of law enforcement and fire and EMS. We were right there ready to get the vaccine. Uh, second round uh, we received on uh, Monday. Uh, some of our folks reported uh, uh, chills and fever and some of that stuff associated with the second shot. Uh, others, like, like myself, the second shot wasn't even hardly noticeable. Uh, it hasn't, it didn't, it didn't miss a step since Monday afternoon. Um, we had about another 10% of our team uh, take the first shot this week when the second round was available after some who were hesitant uh, kind of saw it and didn't see any of us turn into werewolves or something uh, over the first three weeks. They thought they'd give a shot <laughs> and go take it, which was great. Uh, so we're, I guess about now we're sitting somewhere around 70% uh, uh, oh, wow. great for our department, which is super. I wait. I told be first in Steve. Yes. This is Cleo. I'd like to see um, a copy of that cyber assessment, if possible. Oh, absolutely. In yep. person. Okay, thank you. Yep, absolutely. Sure Since you're here upstairs, you want a hard copy of that? I can print that out and bring a hard copy to you, or you want it digitally? A uh, hard copy would be great. I will print it and bring it to you after the meeting is over. Thank you. No can problem. Can that be forwarded to the rest of us as well, digitally? <laughs> I think so. There's some password protection associated with that document, yeah. so I'll need to send the password uh, in a separate email. I'll send the document and then send the password uh, separately. Isn't that, a, isn't that a security concern to be sending out a report like that? We'd be better off just getting a hard copy mailed to us. Smart team did it. <laughs> yeah. Steve, did, did you send it electronically? Uh, when it first came out, or did when it was I know you, I know you shared it with the people at the backup center. And I can't remember if you shared it with with others. Uh, it's possible I didn't email that out. That I put it up on okay. the screen for the folks when we talked about it. But it's possible I did not share that document. Um, I know there were things you deleted that you didn't that you didn't share. You you thought that you know there were right. some things you didn't want to share. Correct. Yeah, there are parts of the document that that is. Um, very specific that we did not share. The part that I would print for you all is, is um, uh, public public information and, and uh, general uh, takeaways on our health and not specific, this specific problem, that specific problem, if, that, if that's okay. If you want to get into the specific details, we can um, probably just need to share that on site here if you want to visit. But yeah, I've got about an eight page, maybe 10 page document that hits the highlights of the things we need to do without getting into the, the, the weeds and causing a risk. That'll satisfy me. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't need a copy. I would. Uh, I would be comfortable with uh, Cleo and Doc, Doc, uh, Mr. Martini just looking over it. If it's something that 
uh, I as a board member need to know. Other than that, I'm just going. I, I prefer not to have. I don't need a copy. The only reason I want a copy is this is one of the things that I think I've been working on for two or three years because I felt like it was something we needed to do way back then. So it's taken us mm -hmm. this long to get here. I just really want to see where we're at in today's environment. And we do have a way to go. I mean, I just know that. Uh, so I just wanted to. But if it's an issue, I don't have any problem not getting it. No. Is this the same thing that we went over that day during the meeting that he pointed okay. out? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I was fine with that, but if this is an update, uh, like you're it's saying, not, to see where we are. Oh, It's not. I just wanted to, to read, but like I said, if it's an issue, I don't need a copy of it. I can ask questions and get it. Can you at some point, uh, can we at some point do an update just to see where we are, like you did before when you first put the results out there? Sure. So uh, that's what uh, 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 Member Gleason is, is asking uh, today. Uh, our, our visit, our site assessment that we had done in August uh, was a static assessment. So they come in, they sit down with us for about three or four days, they assess where we're at and what's going on, and then they leave. They do, they do not offer or are not offering through the state contract um, continual monthly monitoring of our system. Uh, that's what uh, uh, Member Gleason has encouraged us to find ongoing uh, cyber monitoring so we know exactly where we are continuing. And that's where we are today. We've got three separate quotes from uh, separate vendors and are prepared to make a proposal to you all at the February meeting uh, to, to consider one of those for, to provide that service. The February meeting, so uh, Ms. Ch Ms. Cleo, is that where we can do our follow-up to just see where we are and uh, what Dr. Martini suggests? We can do that follow-up in February. Uh, really going forward based on what they're doing, you should be able to get a follow-up. I don't know how many times a year they'll do it here. Uh, I've been involved in another organization where we started this three years ago, and it's, it's a long process to get started, but once you do, it's, it's very helpful, and it'll, it'll tell you everything yeah. you need to know. So. Yeah, I'd like to see where we are, especially considering what just happened during the uh, Christmas bombing and things like that, to see if it exposed anything else that was at risk, because I wasn't aware that so many entities or agencies were, were using AT&T. It affected our whole state system, along with other areas. So that was just interesting. So... Um, I really would like to see where we are. So, Madam Chair, if that's something that we can look at uh, when Dr. Martini is uh, has something that he can show us so we can keep our eyeballs on that. Sure. And, Ruby, this is Dave. Yes, sir. Uh, so that, that was one of my concerns when, when the attack happened. Here you, David. This, that was one of my concerns when the attack happened. Uh, whether it was cyber initiated or not, uh, being in the industry now uh, for a while, cyber bad guys look for diversions of that sort where they can <laughs> then start attacking you in the back door. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, most, and uh, I'm not sure if this has something to do with us. Or, um, uh, just like with something I saw on the news last night about. Um, they never said it was specific. Uh, anyway, uh, what are these unemployment checks that were being uh, misdirected or had been accessed? And they it just put the story out there. They didn't say whether it was an inside job or outside job, but the um, unemployment checks that are being misdirected, accounts being changed, passwords being changed. Security questions being changed. Um, it's just, it, it's just like it would, uh, like it was a distraction with that emergence, with that bombing, and uh, you just never know what's coming up the back door. So um, anyway, I would like to know uh, just what you've put in place and what you've learned since this bombing happened with our system, because. I didn't have to use 911, but I just don't know what would have happened had I had to. Now that we couldn't access it. That was a scary moment. Yep. 
Yep, I completely agree. I think it's uh, fair to say that Metro ITS, uh, who, who protects most of our stuff, uh, does have ongoing cyber monitoring in place for a lot of their, their pieces and components. Really, our focus is, uh, is how our phone system is exposed and a few other pieces of our infrastructure that kind of works around, around and separate of uh, the Metro IT, uh, ITS system. So uh, we'll be able to move in forward and have both of those for you. I'm printing that document for you now, uh, Ms. Duckworth, and I'll bring it upstairs uh, uh, when we're done. Thank you. No problem. Want to give an update on the renovation. We had a site visit here yesterday. Finally, the, the, uh, the RFQ, the request for, for quotes, went out and was published uh, earlier this month. Uh, we're, I think it's uh, until February the 26th, folks have to mm -hmm. give their responses to those quotes. Uh, we had a site visit with about four different contractors uh, yesterday, or design architects, uh, yesterday to see all the different pieces of the building that are proposed to be renovated. Uh, and we're looking forward to getting those quotes back. Uh, General Services gave an, a time estimate for the project to be complete by spring of 2022. Uh, I, I, my, my stomach flipped when we gave that timeline. I'm hopeful once we identify a, an architect, we can have another conversation about uh, maybe a six to eight month timeline and not a 20, well, not 12 month timeline. I, think the, I don't think we have 12 months worth of work to do here. It's mostly walls and paint and and, uh, and, and moving some, you know, putting in a door here or there. So I think we can we can move it along. But that project is underway. And I can't thank this group enough for leading that charge. Um, I know a lot of that, but I, don't, I won't say I know. I'm highly suspicious that a lot of our hangup had to do with, uh, with some of the budget concerns and questions that, that were lingering on into December for uh, Metro government. And as soon as that, uh, that, that tax recall uh, question came off the, off the table, uh, we move forward with some of these lingering projects like this. The money's always been identified for the project, but uh, we we're finally able to move forward with it now here in, uh, in January. Now that that's not a not an issue, so I'm glad to see it moving forward, and I appreciate your support as we as we advance that that mission. Um, separately, we also are having a, a a pipe restoration, pipe renovation project. It's not part of our renovation process, but the drain pipes inside and throughout this facility that bring rainwater from the roof down and out in other places that have been falling apart for years uh, are in the process of uh, being replaced by uh, PVC with insulation. That work should start next week or the week after and last about six weeks or so, assuming we can stay dry long enough to get it done. Uh, that'll be a great thing. We'll stop uh, replacing ceiling tiles in the, in the building and hopefully won't have any impact to uh, console furniture. Somehow, some way, we've, we've avoided that as a, as a problem. Uh, the last update I have to give is a legislative discussion. Stop sharing this screen so we can just look at each other's faces. Um, well, I say I stopped sharing. Now I'm sharing nothing. There we go. Larry, do you have the screen? I've got I've got a shared screen, but I don't think it's me anymore. I'm trying to get the screen back so we can look at each other's faces here for the last little bit. But I didn't take it back. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm closing my documents, and and as I go, there we go. Maybe that's it. Is that aha? There we get. All right. So we're stopping sharing the screen. Here we all are. Uh, technology. It's so much fun. I talked to Will Denami the last, uh, we've, we've been in touch really probably every two or three days for the past few weeks uh, as session is underway. There's a special session now. Uh, he's in a unique situation where nobody but legislators are allowed down uh, downtown in the, in the plaza or on the grounds or in the offices. So he has to do his work uh, remotely and outside trying to still stay uh, stay inside. Uh, so far, so good. He's aware of, of kind of two initiatives that, that are uh, a threat or a concern to uh, to our district, I believe. One of those is the direct dispatch bill, that effort that says we want to put, uh, with, with an increased amount of funding uh, made available through a surcharge increase, uh, a, a small group of people that say operations, all the operations of uh, the 911 center should be pushed underneath the district. Um, that, 
<clears throat> to make that happen, one effort is to restructure the, the membership of the State Emergency Communications Board. Uh, there is an, a, a, an effort underway to, to change who serves on the State Board. Right now it's uh, four or five members from, from districts like me or other, uh, other 911 districts that, uh, that work inside the 911, 911 centers. Uh, and then members from uh, city government, county government, uh, and the, the comptroller's office. Uh, there's an effort to reshape that board to be primarily um, telephony vendors, so AT&T, Verizon, or other um, uh, carrier networks, or uh, elected city or county government officials, uh, and that would be make up the, the board. Uh, we have a concern about that, that if you give this over to the, to the um, no offense to AT&T, but uh, we had plenty of redundancy built in at the local level, and we were all downstream of their uh, single point of failure. Uh, and, and I'm not sure that that's where, where you want to go, uh, but that's the idea. Is if they restructure the board, and there are other states that function this way, Virginia being one, uh, and there are others. I think Mississippi's uh, state board is similar. It's pretty much all, all carriers with very little input from uh, operational folks inside the 911 center. So that's a piece that's a, that's a threat. Um, to counter that effort, obviously education is one part. To counter that effort, Will is working with uh, um, Tennessee Municipal League to help offset. Kind of, kind of the concern is shift the cost of running a 911 center completely onto the surcharge, so local governments can get out of the out of the business of paying for the facilities or the people or any of those pieces. Um, another alternate option to that would be to create a, uh, a set user fee at the local government level, allowing local governments to collect a dedicated amount of money, whether that's on a utility bill or a water bill or, or um, uh, another option that has been out there has been on a, on a, like, on a parcel fee, basically associated a parcel, a, a public safety parcel fee. And this isn't specific to just 911. It would be uh, whatever the cost is to a government to provide fire trucks, ambulances, uh, police cars, and, and 911 service to your property so that the lo local government would know, would be able to, to, to guarantee, set, and, and, and obtain the amount of money they know is necessary to provide public safety services to, a, to an area. Uh, that seems to be getting a little bit of traction. There's some interest inside of TML uh, to, to pursue that as an option. And if they can find that solution, then we're able to kind of find a partner to move away from uh, this desire out of this small group of folks, uh, Blake Lay in Lawrenceburg and, and uh, Rush Bricken at the state level, to push operations of a dispatch center completely on the, on the surcharge. That's kind of where it's sitting. Not much has been happening in, in, in that way to, to advance that effort right now, only because they're in special session, uh, but we suspect there's conversations, and we see uh, hints regarding that in the, in the background. <clears throat> Madam Chair, that's all the different things I have to advise after my – you won't go three months again without having a meeting because I'm going to talk too much, and I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I appreciate your Thank time. you. Thank you very much for the update. That is all that's on the agenda. Do we have anything else to discuss that anybody's aware of? Remind everybody, we do have a meeting in February. I think it's like February the 18th. Put it on your calendars. And hopefully soon, rather than later, we'll be able to meet in person again. Like this meeting, being able to see each other. So um, a motion to adjourn would be in order if we have nothing else to discuss. I so move that we are adjourned until February 18th. I have a motion from Lorinda. Do I have a second? I'll second. Ruby has a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Do I have any opposed to this motion? Hearing none, everybody that's on the phone call is voting yes to adjourn. Thank you. Thanks, all. See you next month.